Participant observation involves the researcher joining a group of people, taking an active part in their day-to-day -day lives as a member of that group, and making in-depth recordings of what he or she sees. Participant observation can be overt, in which case the respondents know that the researcher is conducting sociological research. Or covert, meaning undercover, where the respondents are deceived into thinking the researcher is one of them, and they don't know the researcher is conducting research. Your text discusses Sadir Venkatesh, who was notable for doing research on drug dealers and gang life in the projects in Chicago. This is a great story, and I encourage you to read about it. Secondary analysis is the reanalysis of either qualitative or quantitative data already collected in a previous study by a different researcher, normally wishing to address a new research question. Analysis of documents is often content analysis of movies, video, TV books, magazines. These are all content analysis types of subjects. A good example is the documentary video by Sut Jolly, Codes of Gender, which analyzes TV, video, and magazine content to illustrate how we do gender. Experiments must assure that there's an adequate control group. The control group is defined as the group in an experiment or study that does not receive treatment by the researchers and is then used as a benchmark to measure how the other tested subjects do. A dependent variable is what you measure in the experiment and what is affected during the experiment. It's called the dependent variable because it depends on the independent variable. In a scientific experiment, you cannot have a dependent variable without having an independent variable. A formal experiment must have specific stages, and each stage has to be deployed independently with both the control and the experimental group. The big difference is the exposure to the independent variable. The control group is not exposed, while the experimental group is. Another big aspect of scientific work is assuring that the differences between causation and correlation are noted. Researchers talk about correlations when two variables occur together. The example in your text is domestic violence and battering and alcohol abuse. Because batterers engage in spousal abuse more often when they abuse alcohol, this makes it appear that there's a connection between the two. Does the alcohol abuse cause the spousal abuse? The box provided in Table 1.5 examines the relationship between the two. It looks at dependent versus independent variables and explains there is a correlation and not necessarily a causative effect. In a spurious correlation, two events are inferred to be related despite having no logical connection when examined more deeply. In order to establish causation, there must also be what's known as temporal proximity. Temporal proximity means that one thing happens before something else does. For a variable to be a cause, the independent variable, it must precede that which is changed, the dependent variable. And it's critical that the researcher determine that there are no spurious correlations. And this is a very difficult thing to do when measuring the social world. Our social world is a complex place with many different factors and variables leading to our social outcomes. There could be a third variable that's not identified, tested for, for which no control group has been established. This makes social research very problematic. Researchers will also establish the strength of the relationship through determining the correlation coefficient, which will help determine just exactly how strong the relationship between the two variables are. 
This is a statistical measure used for quantitative data. If two variables are always related, that is, they are always present together, they have what's called a perfect positive correlation. The number 1.0 represents this correlation coefficient. Nature has some 1.0s, such as the lack of water and death of trees. 1.0s also apply to the human physical state, such as the absence of nutrition and the absence of life. But social life is much more complicated than physical conditions, and there are no 1.0s in human behavior. Two variables can also have a perfect negative correlation. This means that when one variable is present, the other is always absent. The number negative 1.0 represents this correlation coefficient. This can be a complicated aspect of data interpretation for a beginning sociologist. So just know that there are differences between positive and negative correlations for now. Sociologists are also very concerned about having unobtrusive measures. The Hawthorne effect, also referred to as the observer effect, is a type of reactivity in which individuals modify an aspect of their behavior in response to their awareness of being observed. The original research was done on lighting changes and work structure changes, such as working hours and break times in a factory work environment. The researchers found that paying attention to overall workers' needs would improve productivity. Later interpretations, such as that done by Landsberger, suggested that the novelty of being researched changed the subject's behaviors, and that the increased attention from the research could lead to temporary increases in workers' productivity. This interpretation was dubbed the Hawthorne effect. Ethical concerns are also an issue for researchers. One example in your text regards Loud Humphrey's research, which was then later published in his book, Tea Room Trade. His study called into question some of the stereotypes associated with anonymous homosexual activity in public places, demonstrating that many of the participants lived otherwise conventional lives as family men and respected members of the communities and that their activities posed no threat to non-participants. Because the researcher misrepresented his identity and intent, and because the privacy of the subjects was infringed upon during the study, tea room trade has caused a major debate on privacy for research participants, and is now often used as an example of highly controversial social research. Humphrey's study has been criticized on ethical grounds in that he observed acts of homosexuality by masquerading as a voyeur, and that he didn't get his subject's consent, and that he used their license plate numbers to track them down and interviewed them in disguise without revealing the true intent of his studies. Humphreys claimed to be a health service interviewer, and he asked them questions about their race, their marital status and occupation, and so on. As we put some closure on this chapter, I want to summarize by discussing the historical tension within the field of contemporary studies. Sociology first emerged in the early 1900s as a way to improve society. And then it later became more focused on developing abstract knowledge. That would be the second phase. Finally, in the third phase, which we're in now, sociology tends to have a more applied focus. Sociologists seek ways to apply their findings. These are essentially sub-areas, and often college graduate studies will emphasize one or the other of those areas. Finally, an emerging trend is globalization. The United States dominates sociology, and we U.S. sociologists tend to concentrate on events and relationships that occur in our own country. Most of our findings are based on research in the United States. Globalization is destined to broaden our horizons, directing us to greater consideration of global issues. So that concludes our intro chapter in sociology. We've touched ever so lightly on the basics, from what sociology is, 
and talked a little bit about the theorists who have been the major contributors in this area of study. And we've also talked a little bit about the research methods that have shaped the findings in sociology. Up next, we'll look at an essential concept in sociology, that of culture.